Good afternoon, Aristides. And I know I pronounced your name correctly because you told me that I sounded almost Greek. Hello, Sebastian. Yes, you pronounced it just great. Thanks very much. All right. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for making the time. As you know, I'm having a series of video interviews with various contributors to Dev Library, devlibrary.withgoogle.com. Some of your content pieces, some of your open source projects have been selected. They're on the website. We're going to talk about one of them today. But before we do that, let's talk about you. Who are you? And I asked you before this interview to think about maybe three keywords or three numbers, three things that would define you or just share a little bit about who you are. Do you want to share it with us? Sure. My name is Aristides and I'm from Athens. I live in Greece and uh, I'm a Google developer expert for Angular. Currently, I work as a front-end web developer at Plexer, and I have also uh, submitted one of my GitHub projects in the dev library website. Uh, if I would like to characterize myself with three words, then I would say uh, self-disciplined, um, perfectionist, and uh, well-planned. Well, that's interesting. When you mention perfectionist, isn't that usually a drawback or a weakness to be perfectionist? You know, there's the saying, and by the way, I say this because I'm a perfectionist myself. And sometimes you have uh, that impression that by spending too much time on perfecting the details, you're just not moving on to the next stage or you're wasting time on unnecessary details. What do you think about this? Especially for the industry that I'm working, mm -hmm. uh, which is coding, I think perfectionist should be a, an advantage because when you uh, actually you can't reach perfection, perfectionism at all, 100%. But when you are trying to reach it, then you're going to reach one sample of perfectionism. So your code will not be always perfect, but if you try to make it perfect, you will make it very good. How do you know when it's good enough? Sorry, I'm going on a, on a tangent here, but I'm reacting live to your response, not going through the questions that I had prepared, but I'm curious, how do you know when it's good enough? Because I think a lot of people and a lot of developers may be wondering the same question. How do you know when my code, the code I'm building is good enough? What are your tips and tricks around this? Uh, if, you're, if you cannot sleep at night, then I think <laughs> that you're, you're guessing your code is not correct, right? Uh, or if you if if you have a task to accomplish and uh, you're trying it uh, again and again and you can't complete it, then I think this is an indication that the approach that you take is not correct. So I think it it is mostly a feeling that something is not correct, not an actual you know, not an actual thing that this is not correct. You have most most times, especially for me, it's a feeling that something is not fit, does not fit well, or is not does not seem to 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 fill in the puzzle. You know, that's totally fair. You mentioned that you are a Google Developer Expert. Not everybody knows what a GDE is, and since this is on YouTube, it's linked down there in the description if you want to know more about what the GDE program is. And thank you for being part of that program. Let's talk about Angular because this is what your area of expertise is. What surprised you in a good or a bad way in terms of challenges or in terms of things that you found easier than initially you thought they were when you started developing on Angular or maybe something that you've realized over time? Uh, I think that the most interesting part was the three pillars of uh, the Angular framework. They are not pillars, but this is what I like actually to talk about, like pillars. The first is that it is cross-platform, and when we say it's cross-platform, it is the community that makes it cross-platform. Okay, actually, Angular in reality can be written for different environments, but there are all those community projects that enable it to run on those environments. Second. Uh, the incredible tooling that it has. Uh, it has a very powerful Angular command line interface or the development tools that uh, th they recently launched, uh, which allows you to debug and profile your Angular applications very easily. And uh, the third one is uh, that it is very easy to onboard and very quickly, 
because it has all these uh, libraries that allows you to integrate whatever uh, your need is into your application. If you want forms, then there is a library that you can use. If you want HTTP integration, there is also a library for this. So it is an all-around framework that you can use for your everyday development, development task uh, as a web developer. What challenges did you face, if any, when you, you're developing on Angular and how did you overcome these challenges? Mm, the biggest uh, challenge is um, the documentation uh, because Angular is, it is an open source uh, framework, JavaScript framework, so the documentation is maintained by the Google, by the Angular team and also from the community. So having a very concise and uh, well-designed documentation um, is a bit, uh, you know, it's something that concerns you when you want to develop uh, applications with Angular. So the, the ability to find some things, uh, some documentation about Angular, it, it was my main challenge when I was developing. How did you overcome that challenge when the documentation was maybe subpar or was missing? What kind of solution did you did you adopt to try and go around the fact that maybe the documentation was not always great? Uh, I read, I, I went through the source code and I went and wrote this document, this piece of documentation that was missing. Oh, great! Uh, excellent. Uh, let's talk about. Uh, you the project, one of the projects that you've submitted that got selected on the Google Dev Library. This is uh, a library that you built for Angular, if I'm not mistaken, and that enables your uh, CLI application, your Angular CLI command line interface application to run in the desktop, if I'm not mistaken, using Electron, which is itself another open source software framework. Let's, do you want to talk about it? Give us a, a quick intro about what this does and how it's helping developers? Sure. Um, the library, which is called NGX Electronify, allows any Angular CLI application or monorepo application using NX uh, dev tools to run your Angular application in desktop mode. What it does actually is it uh, loads your application inside an Electron window and it looks like it is a native desktop application. So, um, if you have an Angular CLI application and you want to maybe to create a prototype of your application or make a demonstration to one of the stakeholders, you can use the NGX Electronify, convert it to a desktop application and take it with you to to, to showcase it as a desktop one. Now, the purpose of this library was not, there, isn't, there was not a, a specific need that I created, but I wanted to highlight and showcase what you can do with the Angular framework and to, uh, to demonstrate its powerful capabilities, its cross-platform power capabilities that I talked about earlier. If you remember, I talked about cross-platform. So desktop is one of the platforms that Angular can run. Excellent. Thank you for sharing an, an intro. What led you to build this project in the first place? What popped into your mind to think, oh, I'm going to build this. It's, it's useful for me. It's useful for others. And I'm going to make it open source. So what prompted, what prompted you in the first place? And then what led you to make it open source? Right. Um... So, it, in, in, the, in the company that I work, uh, we're using Electron extensively. So, Electron is one of my passions in software programming. The first is Angular and Electron is the second one. So, uh, I, I, I made, some, I made uh, a detailed research about Electron and Angular applications. And first, I wanted to create a library, a wrapper over the Electron API. But then I checked on the open source community and find, found out that there is already a wrapper library for this. So uh, I, I asked myself, I would like to do something for the community that is not out there. And uh, then I had the, an idea of uh, integrating 
the electron framework with Angular. So I created this Angular Builder is called because it integrates into the Angular CLI workflow. So when you run your Angular CLI application, for example, using ng-serve, it is a command of the Angular CLI to start your Angular application, this automatically starts the Electron application. So you have a very smooth integration between the two frameworks. The reason that I made it open source was that um, I wanted to help others that uh, they may have the same uh, curiosity <laughs> as I have about uh, this type of applications to make their own uh, integration. So for example, one can fork my repository and create a different flavor of this library. Excellent, thank you. Uh, what would be your advice for someone who starts with Angular? Someone who's got no experience, maybe they've been coding and on other frameworks and they've heard of Angular and they, and they see other frameworks or competing frameworks. How would they get started? What would you tell them or what would you do in hindsight now that you know everything about Angular? How would you do it differently, if anything, in terms of getting started? I would tell them, I would tell them to read the documentation. Uh, you see, Sebastian, uh, sometimes when you, uh, when you start with Angular, when you are new to the Angular community, you just go to uh, search in Google or Stack Overflow or other websites to get some information about how am I going to get started with this framework. How, this is generally for technologies, you know. When, you're, when you begin learning a new technology, you go to the easy. Uh, to, you're, you're Googling it. This is the easy way. Or you're going to Stack Overflow and uh, type in questions. But I think the most, um, the, uh, the correct way to do this would be to read the documentation first. Because the documentation will have all the necessary information for you to get started. I have read the Angular documentation more than uh, 30 or 40 times <laughs> in my life, all of it. Uh, and uh, you know, why, why would I do this? Why should I read the same thing again and again? Because when you read it, the first time, it's your first time, okay, you will have questions. You will go to search for other things somewhere else. But if you did it the second time and the third time, especially when the version changes, because this is when the content changes, then your brain will um, consume the information more easily because you have already read it once. So uh, my advice, especially for beginners to Angular, would be to rely first and uh, most, mostly on the Angular documentation and then to all the other resources. I think that's very valuable advice. And in fact, if our audience here on YouTube does not believe you, they should also listen to the same advice given by other GDEs and other contributors to Dev Library who have said something very similar. Start with the documentation. And I like the way you've emphasized how you've read it so many times that you're always gonna learn new things or discover subtleties that you may not have realized the first time around. So even as an expert, you're gonna read the documentation over and over again. Let's talk about open source because you mentioned this a few times. Same question, you're a beginner. How do you get started? Where do you look for helping contribute? How can you contribute to an open source project when you've got very little experience or maybe you've never been involved in an open source project? How do you go about this? Maybe creating a new one or joining an existing project? Any piece of advice? Right, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, there are two, in my opinion, there are two ways. Either you will find something that you have passion with. For example, I have passion with Angular, and that is how I started with open source. So if you have passion with a Google technology, go to the GitHub uh, website and search for the Google technology that you are mostly interested. Then open the GitHub repository and go through the issues. Most of these repositories have a label which is called help wanted or good first issue. You can, uh, these issues are destined for beginners. They have been carefully curated from the owners of the repository so that one that 
a person that uh, has no idea about open source contribution can start straight away. Mostly there are documentation, fixes, type of fixes or something like that. A beginner will never dive in straight to the code, right? This is the first way. The second way, if you don't know, uh, if you don't have a specific passion or a specific interest about an open source technology, you can go to github.com slash explore and uh, there is a list with many interesting repositories with various technologies that uh, you can go through and search. Mostly these are something like the trending repositories. Um, and this is the second way that you can get started with open source uh, contribution. Very practical advice. Thank you. What excites you personally going forward? Is there a piece of Google technology that you're looking forward to play with, to discover something that may not be released or that is already released, maybe in another, another area? Is there anything that you're looking forward to playing with? Yeah. I think I would say Flutter is a technology that uh, is, is a bit excited, except Angular. <laughs> and uh, I think this is because Flutter is mostly, is, is also cross-platform. I have seen that there, are, there is very easy to write applications for desktop, for mobile, write once and uh, write for all platforms, right? So I think I would check out Flutter after Angular. But okay. I think Ang Angular is, uh, in every version of the Angular framework, there is always something excited about me that I want to check out. So <laughs> it would be difficult. I think it would be difficult to change. Uh, That's something. fair. That's fair. Uh, last couple of questions. What is the worst piece of advice that you've heard in our industry, in the area of programming, coding, software engineering, any worst piece of advice that you keep on hearing or that you've heard and you think this is terrible, we should not be saying this or thinking that way? The worst is that um, you should quit software programming and do something else. I mean, when you say something to a software developer that starts uh, their career right now, you shouldn't tell something like this because um, you, you were you are a mentor to them so if a mentor says something about says something to to his mentee right says something like this then it is uh, i think it's bad it's not good is it because you think that uh, it's always possible to improve your skills that there's no matter where you are beginner exactly. yes okay yeah yeah you I, you shouldn't disappoint the other person right okay even if, he, even if the other person is not suitable for software programming, because, uh, you shouldn't say something like this because you, he, they will lose their hope and they will not try to do their best to be a software developer. Totally fair. Um, any final piece of advice, any final words you want to share with developers? Doesn't have to be the worst advice or the best advice. Any final words that, that is on your mind that you'd like to share with developers? Yeah, there is a very nice website which is called Developers Library and you should check it out right now. <laughs> there are amazing projects there, I'm, I'm honest about that. And there is a very uh, useful, a very uh, various blog posts about all the Google technologies that you can check out. And if you want, you can start right away and uh, with open source contribution or studying something new. That's very kind of you. Uh, the link will be obviously in the description as well. Uh, last question to you, completely unrelated, but because you're in Greece, any recommendations for people who want to visit Greece of areas in Greece that you particularly recommend or hidden gems or secrets? That's a tough question. <laughs> for <laughs> what some, is your for preference? Local, you know. Um, I would say to taste local food. Uh, for example, uh, Muzaka, uh, Sublaki, <laughs> and also visit um, visit uh, visit two two places, um, Delphi, which is considered to be the center of the world, 
in the ancient times mm -hmm. and uh, Parthenon. I think these two places should be a must go for someone that visits Greece. Thank you for the answer to my unexpected question. Sure. Listen, Aristides, thank you very much for your time. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, you say if Haristo, is that correct to say thank you? Correct, correct. All right. Paracalo. <laughs> thank you so much for your time and that's it. Thank you very much, Sebastian. I really enjoyed this uh, conversation and I hope that uh, developers library website will be will have more content than ever. Thank you.